Hello and welcome to Focus on Liberia. Anson is here hosting and I have with me my partner, Leo Napolo Johnson, who is co-hosting with me, but will be leading the discussion today. Of course, this is Focus on Liberia, where we educate, we elevate, and promote all things Liberia. This program is called Focus on Liberia Spotlight. Our spotlight program is when we throw the spotlight on individuals in our country or in our community doing things extraordinary to advance the betterment of our country. And so welcome, hit that share button as we get started here quickly. Let me now welcome my partner, Leo Johnson. Mr. Johnson, it's good to see you. Thank you so much, Anthony. And it's an amazing opportunity to be here on a beautiful Saturday afternoon with some outstanding Liberians who have been doing and continue to do great work in our country. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so very much. I will now introduce those who are doing extraordinary things in our community. Uh, I have with me Dr. Clarice uh, Kula, uh, who is here. Uh, Dr. Kula is the CEO of the Providence Preservation Foundation. And she is also a representative from a group called the Year of the Diaspora. Dr. Kula, uh, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Hello. <laughs> All right. Also with us is Dr. Nicole Cooper. She is the CEO and medical director for Wellness Partners Clinic. Uh, Dr. Cooper, welcome. It's good to have you. Thank you. Okay. Also here doing something extraordinary with her institution is the CEO of Yasa Rose Edit Learning. You might get in trouble here. The name is Kwawogi. Uh, please correct me on that one. Welcome. It's good to have you. Thank you. Horrible guy, Kwawogi. <laughs> thank you. And thank you. It's good to have you. We have on the phone and joining us from Liberia, Hester Baker. She's a tourism consultant with Unchained Africa. She's here on the phone. Her voice is lively. Let me hear you. How you doing? How is Monrovia? Oh, Monrovia is great. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And we are expecting Nakuita Riggs. That is uh, Nakuita Riggs. She is an elected representative for the U.S. state of Colorado. We are hoping she's going to join us soon. Please, yeah, these are the outstanding Liberians who are doing extraordinary things in Liberia with their respective institutions. Uh, and we are happy to have them to discuss about how they are working in Liberia to make things better for our country. And we can welcome them enough and welcome you who are following the show. At this time, I will turn things over to my man, Leo. Leo, it's over to you. No, thank you, Anthony. And great to see some faces on here that I've met and I know. Some I haven't met yet, but I've heard of. Um, Dr. Cooper, good to see you as well. And Dr. Kula and Kobole Guy, great meeting you for the first time. And Hester, all the way from Liberia. Mm -hmm. But I think um, this is a very important conversation when it comes to how our country has been positioned where we seem to quickly rush to the negative narrative because of how overwhelming the negative narrative has been. And don't get me wrong, for valid reasons as well. But when do we get to the place where we begin to intentionally shift from the negative narrative and start to focus on what is being done to change that negative narrative? And that's why I'm really excited to be here to listen to the work you all have been doing, but to also ask some of the questions that we should be thinking about um, as you all continue to do that work, continue to learn and continue to find more ways to troubleshoot some of the problems. And maybe it might be great to hear from all of you, first of all, to kind of lay, lay out the foundation for us here, um, giving your different groups or <coughs> efforts that you do. So with that, we will start with uh, Dr. Kula. Uh, she is representing two institutions here, by the way. Uh, <laughs> But mainly, I think she's here uh, in her capacity as a representative for the year of the diaspora. That year from you, what is that institution doing in Liberia? All right, so good evening, everybody. So um, we're doing a lot of work on grounds, just 
getting our diaspora together, trying to get us back home. And my, my reason for having this conversation today was we're looking at what is keeping the diaspora from participating. A great number of things are. But when you talk to a lot of diasporans, especially people that have children, the first thing they say education. You know, what's up with the education system? How can my kids go to school there? What are the better schools in Liberia? And there are some. Uh, you also hear about healthcare, which is why Dr. Cooper is here to talk about healthcare. This woman is phenomenal. She is doing some great things in Liberia. And I can't wait for her to share with you guys. Then you talk about um, the, the whole tourism business, which is part of our year of the diaspora, trying to bring people home, trying to showcase Liberia, what is there, what's on ground. You know, when we go to Jamaica, we see all these cool things. When we go to Liberia, we have equally cool things, but we don't know about them. So we're trying to showcase all of those good things. And then, of course, Nakuita Ricks, Ricks will come on, and she will be talking about investment opportunities in Liberia. And then Corbo Lagai and I, when we talk about the education piece, we're looking at if we're going to get these kids educated, start in the preschool. So we're going to share some materials that we both have created, some activities that, you know, the schools can use to better the education system. So for me, it's I'm looking at the overall umbrella. Um, even though I'm representing Year of the Diaspora, I'm also representing the education field. So I'm looking forward to this conversation today. Thank you. Uh, let also go to Hester, who is in Liberia. Uh, and Hester is a tourism consult consultant from Onchin, Africa. Hester, let me hear from you. This institution and a connection to tourism, you are a consultant there. Tell us what work are you doing in Liberia? Okay, well, um, first of all, let me let me let me let me um, clarify what Unchain Africa is. Unchain Africa is my company okay. that is a marketing, communications, and publishing firm. Mm -hmm. And so, Unchain Africa has been around for some time, and we do more than tourism. We've worked in you know publishing from Style Magazine in Atlanta, coming into Liberia and publishing Liberia Travel and Life and other and other publications. However, my consultancy is with the International Trade Center. I'm the branding and marketing consultant for them. And the International Trade Center is an organization that uh, began working on a tourism development project in Liberia uh, about five years ago. I joined them in October of 2020, um, 2020. And my role has been really to focus on branding and marketing Liberia. When you look at the Liberia brand, you know, there are so many challenges with the tourism brand for Liberia. As a matter of fact, the Liberia brand in general has you know, really struggled some fatal blows, you know, in the last 40 years or so. And so it's, it's something that, you know, really, really impacts how people see Liberia in terms of travel. So it's something that really requires real attention. We are at sort of an in, infancy stage in the tourism development project. But the work is, is amazing. We are very excited because we have laid, we are laying some sound foundations for tourism in Liberia. I believe that once we continue to we will be able to gain a lot of traction. So I believe we are on the right path. And, you know, we'll have a chance to talk more about it, you know, as the program progresses. Thank you. Definitely, we will uh, talk more about it. Uh, let us come to you, uh, Dr. Cooper. Um, your institution, uh, tell us a little bit about the work that it's doing. Hi, yes, yeah, so um, as I mentioned, I'm Dr. Cooper, Dr. Nicole Cooper, and I'm the CEO and Medical Director of Wellness Partners Clinic. And uh, Wellness Partners Clinic is a full service private medical clinic in Liberia. We are a multi-specialty clinic. We have our integrated lab pharmacy imaging observation capacity. But apart from just the you know, excellent, well-coordinated health services that we are offering, our concept is really healthcare companionship. So going along with patients from the moment of diagnosis to the moment of stabilization or cure to make sure that they are followed along the way and get their best possible outcome. Aside from that, we also really specialize in innovative health financing. And when I say financing, I don't mean in the way that uh, the big banks and venture capitalists think about it. We are talking about how the patients are financing their care directly. We 
do plans um, that help patients be able to more easily afford their care and more easily plan ahead for their care. And we're also very focused on healthcare coordination because a lot of people in Liberia follow their doctor from hospital to hospital, and they have the utmost confidence in the provider that they see. But they fail to realize that no matter how strong that doctor is, if there is no system supporting mm -hmm. them, they mm -hmm. cannot get the outcome that they need. So we really focus on coordination within our system to make sure that no matter which provider you're seeing, the system is strong enough to make sure that you can get the outcomes that you need and you can get that recovery that you need. We try to make it as easy as possible for patients to get what they need within our system and for even family members to be able to coordinate um, on behalf of their patients, no matter where they are. You know, we, we have all the time. We have people call us from the U.S. and say, my somebody is sick in Liberia, can I send them to your clinic? And the process of getting appointments, you can even request your appointments online. The process of getting appointments, the process of making advance payment is so simple that they prefer it because it makes it so easy for them to handle that type of responsibility in Liberia, even in their absence. So this is what we're working on, you know, our healthcare companionship models and our, our patient payment models that really make it uh, very convenient for them. Uh, yeah, the idea is just to create that system that's as easy as possible for patients to participate in their own care and really be able to stick to the plan so that they can get that best possible outcome. Well said. Thank you. Next, we want to hear briefly from Yasa Rose Ellie Lenning. I am the CEO and founder of Yasaro's Early Learning. And Yasaro's Early Learning is a company that focuses on making sure young children know how to read while helping parents and teachers make teaching easier. So what we have done is in Liberia, um, we've produced resources for um, early learning centers there already. Um, and that has been through partnerships with uh, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority uh, Incorporated, Delta Iota Chapter, um, making sure that we're supporting early childhood. Because often, in even in developed countries, early childhood is, is left behind. But if you pour into uh, young children early on, you actually spend less um, as they get older. So just really focusing on making sure that literacy is at the forefront and providing resources that are developmentally appropriate to schools and to parents, as well as supporting through any kind of um, teacher training. Great stuff. Um, thank you very much, um, Kobli guy. Thank um, you. Yeah, I, hey, I like to call people by their names. I rather make the mistake of correcting. <laughs> <laughs> so we have with us um, um, our representative here, Nakrita Ricks, who just joined us. I see she just joined us here. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We gave you the opportunity to just introduce yourself quickly um, while we were on the rounds of introductions there. Uh oh. And then we lost her as soon as I said. <laughs> <laughs> can you guys hear me? We yeah. can hear you now. I was just saying we gave you the opportunity to just introduce yourself quickly. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is State Representative Nakrita Ricks from Colorado. Um, I represent District uh, 40. I'm also a Liberian American and excited to be here to talk about the diaspora activities that we have happening right now in Liberia. As you know, Liberia is in need of the support of all of its uh, citizens and people connected with it. And uh, so we are looking forward to a lot of great initiatives around education, healthcare, investments, and all the things that are needed to move the country forward. So I'm happy to be here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Anthony, do you have a question? You want me to go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I I, I will get the ball rolling right away with a question and, and, and Clarice, you can, get in, you can jump in here or anybody else can actually jump in. Um, I would like to hear from you directly all of the work that has gone into this. And I know some of it firsthand because I've heard, I've talked, I've been in some of the meetings as, as well. Why do you think we're still having a challenge? And I'm saying it personally, when we see Liberians in the diaspora, now many of them have done their best to work along, but we're still having a challenge to see that overwhelming wave that you need to really hit the message home in terms of Liberians embracing this, but coming back 
um, to be true to what we're trying to do here, because I see it as one of the only ways that we can do what we're out to, to do. Why do you think we're still having this challenge? I'm, I'm going to jump in and just take a stab at it. I mean, <laughs> so the, the expertise, the technical know-how, resources, all of those are here with those of us, many of us that are here in the, the diaspora. I think you know, as far as connecting directly and knowing how we can um, leverage the technical know-how, the knowledge, the skills, the abilities, the resources, that is probably maybe a challenge. Some people want to go, they haven't been back home, they don't know exactly where to start. So I think it has to be an organized effort. And some of the initiatives that we have started, such as the Diaspora um, conference that we did last month, kind of getting like-minded people together um, trying to organize is a good approach into doing it. So I, I think it takes a lot of organization. It can't just be everybody go there and, and then what are they doing or how are they doing? So we really need to start organizing efforts in different sectors. And I think then we'll see more success and see you know the fruits of our labor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to piggyback off of what Representative Rick said, said just now, it's all about numbers or strength. There's strength in numbers, right? If you go individually, you've got this one project here, this one project there. But if we are a conglomerate and we're going together as a team, it makes a difference. So I think it's, it's, it's high time that we here at the diaspora put ourselves together. Many other countries have done it where the diaspora actually began to come in and do certain things. I know like in Ethiopia, they have investment funds and all these different things. So when they want to do a major project, they have money set aside to do that because one person can't do it. So it's all about us coming together as a group, which is what we're pushing for during this year of the diaspora. That's why I keep calling it that. Is the year of the diaspora is the time for the diaspora to unite and try to go back to Liberia and do what we should have done years ago. Thank you. Um, I know um, Dr. Cooper also from your side, I know you're in Liberia and I often say, this is where the link is connectivity, right? When we do what we do in the diaspora, we work, we get to Liberia, truth be told, if you don't have the lending in Liberia, it can be extremely difficult to satellite and do things without necessary. And sometimes that's where the challenge is coming from. So Dr. Cooper, I'll give you the opportunity for someone like yourself. I know you've spoken specifically about the work that you do with the, with the private clinic that you run, but how do you see some of this fitting in? How you can use that opportunity also to kind of go into um, um, some of the, the specifics. Yeah. So there's a few things I would like to say. I would like to um, follow up. I think it was called the guy that said it about not having, oh no, maybe it was you, Leo, that said about not having enough um, of initiative or enough uptake of the initiative from the diaspora side. I would like to say we also don't have a critical mass on the ground, uh, to be honest. There are some of us that are working very hard in our respective fields. And I always want to give credit to that because as was said earlier, a lot of times a narrative about Liberia is very negative as if nothing good can come of Liberia Mm. which is can sometimes be very disparaging for yeah. those of us who are on the ground sweating it out and then the only narrative you hear is nothing good is there and i'm like hello you know <laughs> um so i do want to say even though we do have our pockets of people that are trying very hard and doing very good work at this point in time they are still isolated pockets mm -hmm. and we need to get a critical mass so that those pockets coalesce into a, a group that is moving in a certain direction That's that it. then gets the country moving in a certain direction so it's not only about getting a critical mass in the diaspora it's getting a critical mass on ground mm -hmm. because you can have a critical mass in the diaspora discussing it and planning it but the discussing and the planning does not actively change what is happening mm -hmm. so um the other thing is those two critical masses because i respect the fact that everyone's circumstances are different for example, Representative Ricks has a whole constituency she has to be responsible for that has put their trust in her. And she cannot say, oh, I'm Liberian American, but at this point, I'm going to leave the entire responsibility that I've asked for to give me and mm -hmm. go and to Liberia. You know, right. everyone's situations are different. But the important thing is to have a critical mass in the diaspora and also a critical mass on the ground. For me personally, anyone that has ever had this conversation with me individually, before the conversation has ended, I've helped you start brainstorming your return. I've helped you start, <laughs> if you're not returning, I've helped you brainstorm what you would do from there. But we'll... Ooh, no, 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 no. 
She was on a roll then. We kind Whoa, of it was getting good. <laughs> Can I add something in there? Yes. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. There, there is one thing I would like to say is when you're we're talking about why we don't have the participation we think we should, it's something people don't really necessarily think about, but it's that, where is that Liberian pride? Right. Where is that love of country above yeah. self? And yeah. I think when- Sorry about that. I think I dropped off. Like Oh, sorry. Let me just finish real quick. Yeah, quick. Well, okay, just finish. Was trying finish to drop the and then you come back. Yeah. And if we if we can get some of that going in the people who are in the diaspora, that will help with the idea of getting people wanting to return home because then there is that pride of I'm Liberian. They need my skills. I have something to contribute that is of use there. So I think working a lot, uh, thinking of the technical things, but also the pulling on the heartstrings of people to come back either physically or with their talents in some way to, to um, contribute to moving Liberia forward. Okay, okay Dr. Cooper. Dr. Cooper, you can I think the point that I was just um, trying to finish up is it's important to get that critical mass on ground to mm -hmm. start pushing things forward and yeah. getting the change that we want to see going forward. Yes. And, you know, as it pertains to the topic for tonight, you know, a fresh start, I would really challenge us to say that the fresh start in every area is a, is a fresh start of thinking how this change can happen. Because when yes. you listen to a lot of narrative out of Liberia, a large overwhelming percentage is political. Number one is disparaging at times. Um, number two, it is political and political commentary about what um, particular governments or politicians are or are not doing. But my question is not what is the government doing? My question is what are you doing? Yes. Right? Because that is the fresh start that we can have. Government come, government go. Soldier come, soldier go. The barracks are still there. Right? <laughs> The barracks are still there. So the idea, really, we need to start that fresh start with who do we think is going to make this change. Now, I, I don't want to give the idea that I'm excusing any of our leaders from the accountability right. uh, for providing the, the services that they're supposed to provide or from their due diligence of managing the country's resources. We have to continue to have those conversations. We have... Oh. It happened again. Yeah. Is Hester still on? Uh, can I can I pop in? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And, and Hester, go ahead. Hester, I have a question okay. for you. You are focusing on or uh, in the branding area. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk to me specifically. What are the things that we need to brand uh, as a people uh, so that Liberia uh, can be in a place that will all will be like, yes, this is my Liberia. Why are those things that we need to brand? Oh, she's back. Sorry, I was just finishing one last point, which is that um, we do have to have those. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's all the one second. Yes, sir. Maybe you can hang in tight there with the question. One second. Since, since Dr. Cooper is back. Sorry, I'm going to finish this sentence so that I can be done once and for all. Um, I do think it's important for us to have those accountability conversations, but I also think that we need to realize that Countries are also built by their private sectors. Yes. Countries are also built by um, what private citizens build and the industries that they build, which sometimes even set the standard for government to catch up yes. with. Right? The internet is not built by the U.S. government. No. <laughs> Yet the U.S. government now relies on the internet and picked up on that idea of how to use the internet, but it wasn't built by the U.S. government. That's right. right. So it, it, it's important for us to realize our strength as private citizens. And those of us on the ground, it's important for us to continue our individual recruitment efforts and support people's efforts to come back. We have learned lessons. Don't let somebody come and slip on the same banana peel you slipped on when you arrived. <laughs> let them have a faster you know, yeah. uh, learning curve and be able to, to get through some of those hurdles um, I'll, I'll stop there. I know that there's there's a lot that I can say. I can keep going for hours. So I'll, I'll stop there and let people <laughs> <laughs> continue. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Esther, that's my, my same question. Branding is important. Okay. Uh, and it has to do with the image of the country. What are the things that we need to brand as a people uh, so that our nation can be what we want it to be? 
Well, going back to the whole conversation of the diaspora, even Liberians are afraid to come back mm. because of the Liberia brand mm. that has been built over the years. So imagine trying to get visitors um, to invest, you know, five, six thousand dollars, you know, on a long haul trip, probably even more. Um, when you think about shopping and dining and hotels and all that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a brand, the, the brand challenges that we have, number one, I mean, they're, they're, they're right off the back, you know, war. Like, they're, they had about, um, from 1980, first the cool, then you had the, the war, then you had, you know, we had a we had a president, we've had some stability over the years, we've had uh, several elections that were um, free and clear, and, and so Liberia, Liberia is safe. However, the international community, when they go onto the internet and they research Liberia, let's say somebody's trying to find a trip, um, a place in Africa to visit, and they decide, well, we like the Liberia tour. We hear that, let's say an African American says, well, we hear that Liberia. Are you there? My people are going to tell you, I'm going to try it. But the problem is when you go. Hello? Yeah, go Can ahead. You hear me? Yeah, go ahead. All right. But the problem is when you go onto the internet and you begin to research Liberia, what you see are images of child soldiers. You see images of Ebola. You see images of poverty. And those are things that the, the average visitor will shy away from. I mean, nobody wants to come into a place that um, they consider to be, um, you know, a security threat, you know, or a place that might be, you know, you know, so high in poverty or a place that you know, might be, uh, um, you know, when you talk about disease and stuff like that. Now, lately we've had this garbage situation that also has, be, you know, become a major, major um, brand challenge for Liberia. So those are things we have to, first of all, we talk about rebranding Liberia. Those are the narratives that we have to now work really, really hard to change. You know, we have to be on the internet as Liberians, and we have to start showcasing the beautiful things about Liberia. Liberia is much more then, I mean, the war ended many, 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 many years ago. So we know that we no longer are in war. Ebola came and Ebola went. So we know we no longer have the Ebola problem. You know, we, we, we do have to deal with the garbage situation because it is becoming, it is, you know, coming to a crisis level, especially in Monrovia. However, Monrovia is not Liberia. So when you do go outside of Monrovia, you do have beautiful places, mountains, waterfalls, beaches, culture, you know, heritage and so much more that you can see. So the brand Liberia right now, we, 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 we um, spent about two months um, through 11 stakeholder meetings coming up with a brand for Liberia. And the brand that we developed was Amazing Discovery. And from that Amazing Discovery brand, we are now beginning to push forward with um, many actions to make sure that we, we do try to get the... Um, tourism industry up and running and, and try to get people coming home. You know, get Liberians, first of all, to be the first guest. You know, let the diaspora come home. Then we can begin looking at the international market. You know, we want to get the domestic market um, moving across Liberia. Right now, we sit in Monrovia most of the time. We need to get people going into the, the, the counties like Nimba and Cape Town, you know, into Grand Bassa, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So we have quite a bit of work to do, but we are very positive. We feel that we are at the foundational level, and we are. We have done a lot of work in in that way to um, to get Liberia going. So I think you know we'll talk more in terms of some of what we have done, but um, I feel we're on the right path. Yeah, um, Anthony, quick, maybe a couple of guys will throw this question. Anthony, I'll let you go after my biggest question, and then I will kind of step back here a little bit, and Anthony, you can go just to follow up on what Hester just said. I think it's the elephant in the room. Can you or address how are we going to answer the question you just asked about the diaspora Liberians leading the way when natural born Liberians are being harassed when it comes to going to Liberia, when we are still debating over whether or not people who were born in Liberia and all their families are there, we're questioning whether they are citizens and they belong. When the fact is, if there's a serious government in power, most of the Liberians now could be facing threat of losing their properties or whatever who have taken citizenship in other countries. I'm asking this purely from a development standpoint or so. How can a Liberian in the diaspora look at investing in Liberia heavily when there is this lingering threat over you that you need a visa to go to Liberia and you've been told in your face every day by the politics that you are not a Liberian citizen 
what, when, as soon as something happens, it's the first reminder they gave you. How, how detrimental is something like this to the efforts that we are all talking about here? And is this thing just being talked about or is it actually affecting uh, those who actually fall in that category? Um, is, it I, 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 that, I, is it something that we can you know and continue with these initiatives? And, and I, because that is noise for me. Yeah, I've been to court. I've, Anthony, I've been to court with a family land being confiscated by very members of their family using their status of having an American citizenship and the court honoring that to confiscate property within the same family, literally. So yes, it's having real impact. If any serious government decides to go after it and execute it to the letter, it can have real impact. I mean, I think we need to leave that question for the politicians, guys, because I'm mm -hmm. not a politician. I certainly cannot speak on behalf of the Liberian government. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I can add on this is that I know that there are talks um, or that the bill is on George Weir's, uh, the President Weir's desk to sign for dual citizenship for Liberians, you know, that are in other countries. And that's the extent of it, but that, that sounds like a really good question. And I, I definitely understand how you might be thinking there. And maybe that's another show, but for what we can talk about, we can only talk about, you know, the places that we have jurisdiction or authority that where we can really speak, honestly. Right. And, 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 I'm, asking yeah. I'm just saying, is it, have you realized it impacting because when I talk to Liberians in the diaspora to go back home, do you have you realized is it a concern for Liberians? I agree. Well, I don't well, want to go into the politics of it, please. <laughs> yeah. Can, can I say something? It, it depends on who you are. Different strokes for different folks. I've been in and out of there doing business, doing different things. I've not had any problems, but that's not the same for somebody else. So I think I'm with the Quita on this. We'll just leave that for another time because everybody's experience has been very different. And I have not talked to a lot of people on this situation. So I can't really speak to that, but I can only say. Different strokes for different folks, you know. So that this has been, yeah. Resolved. Huh? Sorry, th this issue was was ruled by the courts at the end of last year, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the the announcements about it, you know, made the rounds on social media. But this was actually sorry. This is Dr. Cooper. This yeah. was actually resolved and ruled on last year in the courts mm -hmm. that there were several. Um, different instances that people found themselves in that could lead to a dual citizen situation. But mm -hmm. the most common one being a natural born Liberian mm -hmm. left the country and, um, and, and naturalized to another country. And the ruling was that person is entitled to Liberian, so that's, that's Liberian right. citizenship and yeah. that effective immediately the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs should be issuing them passports and this should no longer be an issue. Right. So I want to put that out there publicly today. This was ruled on. And I can, um, uh, uh, Clarice and, and Representative uh, Ricks, I can send you a copy of that because I still have it in my phone oh, yeah. of that ruling. This was ruled on. Oh, now, yeah. there was oh, yeah. an exception. Absolutely. The exception was those who were born, I believe it was those who were either even those who were born abroad actually there were three categories if your parents, those who yeah. those who were natural born in liberia mm -hmm. um and then naturalized those who had liberian parents parents but yeah. were born abroad and those first two categories were absolutely entitled to liberian citizenship without question and the ruling was ministry of foreign affairs would stop blocking and whoever is blocking there does not know the law and they need to stop so this was I, actually, add to that? it turns out that the whole conversation was on an unfounded rumor that, that right. people couldn't get their passports. Right. A rumor that was being promulgated by people who actually worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for whatever reason, either for lack of knowledge or for trying to um, extort or whatever. Now, the third category was tricky, and that had to do with um, Liberians who may have been born to parents of two nationalities right. and only ever took the other nationality. Now, I'm not sure why right. that was a distinction because that person still has a Liberian parent, but for some reason in the law, that seemed to have been a distinction. And right. in that case, you, you know, your family or whatsoever chose to have that citizenship instead of Liberian, and then that mm -hmm. was the case where you couldn't right. get a password. But that's a very small, small, yeah. small minority. The yeah. vast majority of people either emigrated and naturalized or have like grandparents and were born there. And those two categories, 
was clearly stated they should be able to get their passport. Right. Yeah. And, and I can add to that because we, we, we're trying to move the conversation before we lose some people. I know the Internet is a little shaky. But, yes, I, and I, I was one of those. I was able to get my passport just fine. That's what I said. Different strokes to different folks. A lot of times things are rumored. A lot of times things are true. A lot of times different things are happening. But I think until we, we go, we won't know. But it's just like she said, these things passed. And so with that passing last year, I was able to get a passport. So I can only speak for me. Uh, but that being said, um, I know we mentioned earlier that we let Hesta uh, say a few words because uh, her internet was a little shaky. So we could go back to Hesta because Hesta is going to speak on tourism in Liberia and the, some of the trips we have planned. Dr. Cooper um, is going to speak on health. Uh, Corporal Lagai and I are going to speak on education. And then investment will be done by uh, Representative Rick. So if we can have Hesta chime in a little bit more about that, I would like for us to go ahead so we can talk a little bit more about the trips because I know and, we don't have too much time. And and that's that. Hesa, I would like to throw this question at you as you come in to explain mm -hmm. uh, what you've been asked to do. That is, mm -hmm. I'm emphasizing on the branding. I know when you are branding, mm -hmm. you are a tourism consultant, you're looking at areas, you're looking at sites. Um, these sites, you can't brand them in the absence of, in, in the absence of people. Uh, you have to include the employment aspect in it. Mm -hmm. So walk us through from those listening. What are they really talking about? How does it impact me or a Liberian, a family member, or in terms of employment, in terms of the image of the country? So how is this branding thing going on looking at our site, the different historical sites? Great question. All right. So just um, to walk you through what we've um, actually accomplished mm -hmm. in the last you know, year and a half, mm -hmm. we began by looking at Liberia and thinking in terms of what would make the most sense for Liberia tourism. So looking at that, we discovered that majority of the best tourism resources in Liberia are found in your rural areas, not necessarily in the urban areas. So what that means is that we have what you call community-based tourism which really comes back to the people. Mm -hmm. So if you were to really pay attention and get into the communities, um, let's say, for example, if you look at Robertsport, Robertsport has gotten quite a bit of play in the last few years because of the point rates that we have. So we went into Robertsport actually last week and spent time with all of the stakeholders from across Robertsport and nearby villages and towns, as well as some of the um, areas outside of Robertsport that are considered like as far as the border near Serium. So we all met in Robertsport last uh, last week. And what, I mean, week before last, and what we actually did, we established in Robertsport the first destination management organization for Liberia. Why are we doing this? The reason we feel that we need to get the destination management organization is because we realize that, uh, okay, backing up a little bit more, last year um, we also had the opportunity to tour 13 of the 15 townships in Liberia, myself along with uh, members from the Ministry of Information, Culture and Tourism. In the, what we call the Compendium of Tourism Resources, which is basically an assessment of the resources of the Liberia tourism sector. So based on that study that was done last year, we discovered that in order to develop Liberia tourism, we had to start at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. Based on that, we decided to take three counties, Grand Cape Mount County, Grand Bassa County, and Nimba County, and establish what we call destination management organizations, which are organizations that drive the tourism sector. We realized that we can no longer depend solely on the government, central, you know, central government to manage Liberia's tourism resources. So we spent time in the last two weeks going to those counties, meeting with the stakeholders, with um, Grand Cape Mount County being the first. In addition to that, we also have been doing a lot of capacity building because last, last January, we, just, we went ahead and uh, developed what we call the marketing strategy for Liberia. It's a two-year marketing strategy that basically says uh, the vision for Liberia tourism is by 2025, we will have 2,000 additional new jobs created from the tourism sector, that we will also have, have at least, um, in terms of revenue generation, $200 million from the tourism sector, uh, specifically generated for the economy just from tourism. 
but realizing that in order for these things to happen, to actually realize this vision, we have to get the counties involved and we have to get out and engage, train the people in these counties, get the young people to get involved in the sector, in, you know, at the lowest level, even if it's becoming tour guides, trying to get more entrepreneurs, even the boys that we call the Tempem boys, trying to make sure that they understand that though they are part of the informal sector, there are ways in which we can incorporate them into the tourism sector, meeting with small business owners, restauranters, people that own bars, you know, whatever it is, the fishermen, trying to make sure that people, you know, become, be, understand that the sector needs them and that they all become part of the tourism sector. It's a lot, it's a lot of work that we have to do, but uh, we are taking it step by step. The most important thing that we've done so far, I believe, of all of the work that we have done is to establish these destination management organizations. And it, it's pretty, pretty exciting because we're able to establish in, in Nimba, for example, we have a, set, a nine man committee that will lead the tourism for Nimba County. In Grand Bassa, there are seven persons that will lead the tourism for Grand Bassa. And, and likewise, in Cape Mount, there are seven persons. So those seven people, I mean, the, the 23 people will be coming into Monrovia, going through a series of training, and they all also developed, in, for example, in Cape Mount, there were five projects that were highlighted that must be done in order to at least to the begin the groundwork for tourism in Cape Mount. And likewise, in Grand Bass, or likewise in Nimba. So a lot of work, <laughs> it's, it's so much, you know, to, to discuss, there's so much going on. But just in a nutshell, you know, that's where we are now. And I think <laughs> in terms of our branding, if we can get, once we get these counters up and running, we begin now to, to really begin transforming the brand. Because these counters will have to spend a lot of time marketing themselves. They will have to set up their own platforms, like, you know, as we have done for the national government. We have this new website, which is enjoyliberia.travel. We have all of the social media platforms that are created, including YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. So we want to make sure that the counties now also have these platforms as well. So it's, it's quite a bit of work, but we're very excited. We're very um, optimistic. And we're excited to see how, how, um, how excited the counties are, how interesting and interested in tourism all of the stakeholders from the police, the immigration, the mayor, the town chief, the restaurant owners, the hoteliers, we all got together over the last two weeks and met. And the conversations were amazing. Yes. Awesome. Now, can I, can I add to what Heston just said? That, that being said, Anthony, can you please put up the December flyer? This is one thing that Heston and I are going to be pushing for tourism in Liberia, like she said earlier and somebody else mentioned. We need to get our diaspora Liberians home. They need to come first. We're trying to sell tourism to the world, right? So we bring our people back. So here it is in December. We have a series of tours. We have different packages um, here starting at $2,144.77. That, uh, that's just the air ticket. Right now, we only have Brussels um, and then a couple of other smaller airlines going to Liberia. So this flight is on Brussels. This is flight only. But if you go to our website, www.libyearofthediaspora.com, Org, you will see on there where um, uh, we have the different packages that can include hotels in different places because Robert's Sports is one of the places that we're going to visit. Hester is going to take us on this tour. It's going to be phenomenal. We, we have an opportunity to visit the different places that she's mentioning here so that we can see for ourselves. You know, there's the Blue Lake. You know, there's Patawi Waterfall. So many beautiful places in Liberia. Places in Buchanan, Edina, even Hester's place, Elizabeth Village in, in um, Bassa. We're going to go and see these things. We're going to Liberia as tourists. Okay, this December, we go as Decembrees and, you know, spend time with family. We can still do all those things. But I want us to be intentional this year. I want us to go knowing that we're going to visit like tourists do. We want to go and see. So when we come back, we can tell our friends, African-Americans, Caribbeans, Caucasian, anybody. This is what we have to offer in Liberia. We want you to come. It's time that we become spokespersons for our own country. You know what I'm saying? That is the way we're going to have to do this. Even right now, I'm going next week to Liberia. Hess and I are working with um, uh, uh, the Journey Home, Home Festival, and they're doing the Juneteenth celebration in Liberia. If you know anything about Juneteenth, it's when the African-Americans in Texas realized they were finally free back in 18, 1865, when freedom had already come two years prior. All right, so we're looking at uniting that movement with our, our 1822 celebration, or if you will, 2022 celebration of um, 
um, our bicentennial. So on the 19th, we're going to have a service at Providence Baptist Church. But these guys are African-Americans who have been living in Liberia for about five years. They've been bringing people on this Journey Home Festival. And this year is the first time they're actually going to have what we have here. Uh, Ebony Magazine has a representative that's coming. Uh, I think Travel and Leisure has a representative. And Travel and Leisure actually wrote a wonderful article about Liberia. So we've got people who are coming from the diaspora who are not necessarily Liberian born, who love our country and are trying to bring people a tourist to Liberia. We need to be doing the same thing. So I'm appealing to all of us. Hesse and I, all of us in this car are appealing. Dr. Cooper is appealing. She loves Liberia. She wants to see us come home. You know, Representative Briggs, all of us, Corporal I got, we want to come home, right? So the goal is then, let's be spokespersons for our countries. Help us pass this message of what we're doing in Liberia. The Juneteenth celebration is June the 17th through the 27th. The um, December trip is uh, December the 15th through January 4th. And then there's even the July trip, people that want to spend Independence Day there. There's a flyer out for that. You guys can contact us if you want the ticket. I think that trip is July 21st through July 29th. But there's just so much that Liberia has to offer. And with all the work that I've seen Hester and her team do on ground, it is high time that we in the diaspora try to help. Let's facilitate that. Let's go back. Let's be the tourists that is a stepping stone to bringing other tourists into Liberia. That's my piece. <laughs> And I just want to jump in as well. Um, yeah. So last December, we also did um, the African Chamber of Commerce. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Everybody's having technical issues. Um, Representative Riggs, we cannot hear you. So I don't know what's going on. Maybe if you go off and come back in, that might help. Um, uh, Kobliga, Kobliga, I know you're having... You've been a bit quiet. You want to jump in while we wait for Representative Rakes, maybe to see if she comes back in? Well, that would be on education. Oh, on yeah. education. Sorry, we can come oh, back. Oh, I, can, I can speak as someone who's just, oh, maybe she's, she's oh, back. Oh, she's, she's back. She's back. back. Now we, we cannot hear you. We can see you, but we can't hear you. Akuna, we can't hear you. We, we can't hear you. We cannot hear you. I don't oh. think she's hearing us either. No, she, she's not hearing us. Somebody might have called her. Uh, uh, okay, what I wanted to say was something that's very quick. Um, look, if we want to really get to help the people of Liberia, the best way that one of the best ways that we can help the people of Liberia, when you come to Liberia, go to the counties. All right, when you go into Robert's Port and you stay in a hotel in Robert's Port and you eat in Robert's Port mm -hmm. and you go fishing in Robert's Port, whatever you do in Robert's Port, that money will stay in Robert's Port with the, with the people that are there. If you go into Nimba, if you go to hike in the Nimba Mountains, or if you go to camp overnight in the Nimba Mountains, the rangers that are there will benefit. The people in Yikipa will benefit. If you go into Grand Basel and you go into Edina, you will have to sleep, you will have to get on the boat, you will have to do so many things. This is how we make an impact on the local community. We have to realize that community-based tourism can transform Liberia. It has a lot of money in it. But the people get to directly be impacted by it. So I hope when Liberians come home this year, instead of staying in Monrovia, it is critical that people get out mm -hmm. inside. But when you get out of Monrovia, that's when you realize how incredibly beautiful Liberia is. Mm -hmm. But we have to be brave and say, let me go up to the mountains and let me sleep in the mountains. We took Laquita, Clarice, and many of us went and slept in the mountains. And oh, it's amazing. So amazing. Okay, we have to do more of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I don't know if we can, I wanted to talk to now Kucha about the investment, you know, what kind of investments are we talking about? Uh, why, you know, uh, such investments at this time, given the need on the ground, but she dropped off. And so I am quickly going to go to the education of Saya quickly. Yes. Uh, so uh, you talk about teacher training. I saw your face there. You're not happy with me. Sorry. Uh, teacher training that is key uh, in Liberia. Yes, the students are there. You're not gonna go looking for them. If we are together in the classroom, someone has to teach them. If that person is not prepared, if that person does not have the skill how to do it, those student time will be wasted in the classroom. So let's talk about that teacher training. How is it going, and what specific training you're trying to provide there? Actually, the teacher training I've supported was with the Liberia Early Childhood Professionals Network. 
what I do at Yasa Rose is provide the resources that are needed because in early childhood, technique is very important, but the actual resources you use with children is very important. What I found when I was on ground is that there was a lack of appropriate resources. Um, it was shocking to see the copy books children were expected to, young children were expected to write in when they were not ready to even hold a pencil. Um, not developmentally appropriate. And then that um, it becomes a problem for the teacher because then children are disengaged because they're not physically ready for that. So making sure they have resources that are appropriate for their age that will allow them to learn whatever it is you want them to learn, but in a way that is developmentally appropriate. So right. making sure that teachers have that, uh, those resources and then showing them how to use it because early childhood is a completely different world <laughs> in mm -hmm. every country I've ever worked in, and I've worked in several. We are a unique uh, set of people who work with young children. Yeah. So so uh, it, to piggyback off of what Corolla Guy just said, and Representative Riggs, just so you know, we didn't hear much of what you said, so we're going to come back to you in a few minutes. There were some technical glitches. I don't know if you if you saw that. But to, to just piggyback off of what you just said, one of the things that Corbola Guy and I have done coming together, because she represents Yasa Rose, I also have a curriculum uh, company where I write curriculum. That's something else that I do. Yeah, I write curriculum for preschools and things of that nature. So what she and I are doing this summer, we decided to come together and to do what we call My Learning Pack. This is, a, this is one of the packs. We're actually taking it to Liberia next week. And we have actually went to ask for to sponsor kids. So if you sponsor a kid in a school, you purchase from us here, we deliver the materials in Liberia. So it's not just for vacation or summer or whatever. The kids can use it at any time. But because school is about to close, it's a good resource to have. So we've got two packages that we put together. One is for pre-K and one is for kindergarten. So this one here is for pre-K. I'm going to show you. All right. Uh, this is an activity book. If you open it up, you know, you have here where the kids can trace the letters. And then at the bottom, the circle things to start with that letter. So you have language arts in the front of this book. And in the back, you've got um, numbers and the kids get to learn to count. You also have this material that Kobala Guy um, put together. And this one is a mastery of um, some reading skills whereby the kids have to figure out what does not belong. So you've got a heart, you've got the sun, and you've got scissors. But we know that sun and scissors both start with the letter S and heart does not. So then you give them a little clip and they can clip on the one that doesn't belong. These are very important early learning skills that children need to have. And what we find in Liberia is, and in a lot of third world countries, you know, we do a lot of mode memorization. It's very difficult for children right now doing, doing it that way because some children who have access to the internet, right? They come home, they're sitting in front of their, their, their computer or their mom's phones. It's very interacting. It's very exciting the way learning is being done. And then you go to school and some teachers like SSG or go, that's boring. You cannot learn when things are not like exciting. So as early school teachers, we need to create that lifelong, long, long, I'm sorry, lifelong love of learning. And the way you do that is getting the right materials, having the teachers train properly, you know, because if not, like Corbella guy said, you're going to lose the kids, right? So I'm going to show you the second pack. This second pack is also, um, this one is actually for kindergarten. So this one has a little bit more skill. So you got the language arts, uh, is a workbook, again, with language arts in the front, lots of reading comprehension skills, activities in here, lots of phonics. And then in the back, you've got a lot of um, math skills, addition, subtraction, missing numbers, all that good stuff. So I did the workbooks, and then Corbella guy did the, um, the other activity. So this one is called Crack the Code. I just want to show you guys quickly, because I want people to fully understand what we're trying to create here. Um, so the first one is a picture of a lemon. You have an L, an elephant starts with an E, you know, that kind of stuff. And you're just trying to figure out what the word would be if you were to crack the code. So the idea is giving students these kinds of things that are fun, they're hands-on activities, they're not sitting there bored, they're doing stuff. They're moving. Children have to be engaged. You know what I mean? So like when I do teachers training, I talk about the engagement. You have to engage kids. They're not just going to sit and listen to you, you know? And when the kids don't listen, then we say, oh, they're so bad or they're so naughty. No, it's all about how we're teaching, what we're teaching, what materials are we putting into the hands of these young people that we're expecting um, to do work for us. We're expecting them in the future to be, you know, people that enjoy learning. But in order for me to enjoy learning, somebody has to show me the ropes. Somebody has to introduce some, some things that are very exciting. Now, part of my curriculum, 
we we use things like you see the map of Africa. You, we use things like that um, when we do the alphabet. We've got alphabet books. We've got alphabet cards and charts. We've got the actual curriculum that the teachers can use. A is for Africa, not apple. B is breadfruit. C is cassava. D is uh, donuts. E is edo. These are things that children in Liberia and West Africa see in their environment. We have to start bringing charts from all the different countries. That That's for these countries. What about our children? What about what they know? P should be for pepper. Okay, they know that mom cooked with that pepper. She beats it in the mortar and she uses it to cook. Take things from the children's environment, right? And use it for the betterment because kids are more apt, even adults, we're more apt mm -hmm. to learn something if we feel a part of that something or if we understand what all of that something is about. So R for me is about rubber. We tap rubber in in um, in Firestone. We do a lot of different things. So the, the goal here is really to use the resources that we have on ground. Marbles, okay? Sticks. We can use sticks to count. You put the sticks down as counters. We don't necessarily have to have the unifix cubes that we use in America. There are other things on ground that we can use. If the school is in the village, all of the things that are around there, we can count coconuts. We can count mangoes. You get what I'm saying? It doesn't always have to be... Um, something that's from the outside world. I just want to throw that in. And I'm sorry, real quick, I know probably like I and I are talking on education, but uh, Representative Riggs has to go. So do you guys mind if we just hear from Representative Riggs one more time before sure. she leaves? Yeah, if okay. she's on, we've been yeah. trying to go. So if she's on, that's great. She yes, go, go ahead, please let her talk. Representative Riggs? We don't, we don't, I don't even have her on. She's been struggling. She says oh. she can't hear us. That's the reason why we don't have her on. I think she fell off. She fell oh, off. She okay. sent me a message. Okay. Well, we see her come back. We'll just stop the conversation. Yeah, so if she comes guy, back, we can, we can just usher her in immediately yes. when she gets okay, back. Okay, guy. Yeah, Kobala guy. Before you, you, you go with your point, maybe I can add this question for what um, Dr. Kula mm -hmm. was saying, and you can jump in there quickly. Um, there's been a conversation around, have you guys ever, and this is amazing, by the way, I'm fascinated by this, and Thank I think you. this is something we should all be sharing everywhere that we actually can and trying to support. Yeah. Have you ever guys fact, have you guys ever factored in the thought process, and I know this is a long one, a long term, around language. One of the challenges we're having in Liberia, when you go to rural areas and schools, there are these traditional tribes and languages that are widely spoken. So mm -hmm. English itself becomes a challenge there. And again, like I said, this is a bigger conversation. Yeah. But maybe as educators, as you guys continue to develop, is this something that could factor in in the long run? Go ahead. Yeah. Well, actually, um, a lot of my background has been in teaching young children who have English as a second, third, or fourth language. Me too, yes. And um, my most recent teaching experiences was in the UAE where our children were coming from Arab speaking backgrounds. And research tells us that when they're very young, what you should do is teach in their native tongue, no matter what it is, because mm -hmm. they are able to better express themselves, they understand things better. And then you can layer on the second language on top of that, because then they'll be able to communicate in with the wider society. But whatever their mother tongue is, and actually my sister and I were talking about this, not just the mother tongue, but the mother accent. Mm -hmm. Very important, because the way you hear things mm -hmm. is very different. So if I was in, uh, uh, like in the UAE, the way I speak to them I try to mimic the accent they have, not as a, I'm making fun of anyone, but I know it's easier for them to understand me when I speak that way. Mm -hmm. And that is something you would have to look at when you're hiring your teachers as well. What accent do they have? Because at the end of the day, they need to be able to reach those children right. that they understand the information regardless of the language. And then you layer on whatever the national testing language would be or the language of business, et cetera. So it's a wider conversation looking at what the larger society wants mm -hmm. as the language of commerce, what the world needs as, as language of commerce, and then backwards mapping it to what is that home language that child is having in their village? Because I'll tell you in the UAE, yeah, they speak Arabic, but Arabic up north and Arabic down south, completely different. So yep. even that we had to adjust. So it's the same thing. Honestly, a lot of the, the things and conversations I had over there map over to, to Liberia. It's, it's very interesting for me. But making sure that children have access to the content in the way they can receive it and understand it is what's most important. 
Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, no, thank That's you. Uh, great, really, really great, great, great point there. And maybe some of us can jump in because what I was thinking, like you were saying, Liberia is already separated by regions and right. popular tribes, right? If you go to Grand Bassa, it's predominantly Bassa people. Right. If you go to Kipman, it's predominantly Vai and the Mandingos. If you go so, you know, the thought process was as educators, as you guys are continuing to develop, just starting to think, how can some of these content they Going back to the value of it as to how that those languages can start being prioritized, mm -hmm. not being extinct, because that's what we're seeing now with kids growing up and mm -hmm. having no clue of those languages. So thank for your and with your expertise. I'm pretty sure that's something you guys will, oh, yeah. will continue to go. Oh, yeah. yeah, because even with the curriculum book, so like I have the ones here because mine is the er, er, emerging literacy. So with my curriculum, I'm looking at literacy. So in here you have all the teachers, guys, you have uh, so many resources in here. But the key thing is, what if? You know, like she says, a larger conversation. What if we were able to get people who could translate and put these things into the children local language for the local teachers? Because in some of these areas, you have teachers who don't speak English. So we have to take that into consideration as well. So then that now means somewhere we got we have to find some money, we have to find some money from somewhere that we can now take our curriculum, our activities, our materials and all those things and translate them into other languages like we do here for Spanish or French or any of those. So it's a little bit challenging because even though we say, oh, in Liberia, we speak English, English is the first language. Yeah, yeah, but still, there are other uh, dialects there that we, we need to be cognizant of because again, the teachers are teaching in those languages and the students are learning in those languages. So it's very, very important how we do this. So we have curriculum now, we've got all these wonderful materials that Korola Guy um, has as well. We've got all these uh, kits that we put together what do we do next with it? We try to take into Liberia. We try to train teachers. We try to talk to the schools. We try to get these in the hands of children. So I'm appealing to all of you guys in the past, but if you want to sponsor a kid, let us know. Um, our website, I don't know if Anson, if you can put our website up so they can just see that. Uh, but then also we I have a CD and on our CD, we've taken like um, songs like uh, when I was passing by, my auntie called me and we've, we've used it to put educational words to it. So you've got the alphabet song, you've got the number so you even have a welcome song that you know it's it, it's just a wonderful wonderful thing because here in america we have cds that play music and the kids learn through music so i created this cd all liberian children on this cd they helped me write the songs took them into the studio they recorded them the songs in the studio their voice their words this is very very key i want people to understand there are children in liberia in america who are rooted for children in liberia and i think it's a wonderful thing so if you could pull up our website, we'd love for everybody to just see it for a second. So if anybody needs some resources, you can go there and check those things out. May I just give some feedback on that as, as someone yes. who's out of the educational sphere, but hearing this, okay. um, there's so many interesting things that I think are so critical that you guys have touched on here. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to say first about the language that that's definitely going to, you know, require a lot of context a lot. to your question. Mm -hmm. A lot of context because we do have at least, you know, 16 dialects, mm -hmm. but all of them are not necessarily written. Right. And every parent that speaks their dialect but does not speak English may not be literate in their dialect. That's a true. lot yeah. of yeah. Liberians, I would venture the majority of Liberians who even may speak their dialect, because a lot of Liberians don't speak any dialect, including theirs. <laughs> yeah. But um the, the majority of Liberians who may speak their dialects are not lettered in their dialect. Mm, so yes. then even if you translate it, if you find a way to, to use Romanized letters to mm -hmm. translate these books, who can actually read it? That's because true. those, the person, I mean, just thinking about the demographic, the person who may be in a rural village who mm -hmm. does not speak English is very likely not literate. Because English right. is really the only language of official instruction in Liberia. In Liberia yeah. So not speaking English is an indication of not having gone to formal education, mm -hmm. which means that no matter what, if you cannot read, if you don't have the reading concept, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what language is put in front of you. You don't have the reading concept. That's true too, yeah. But it's not because it's it's Ba or it's Basa or it's Gil. It's because you don't know how to read in any language, right? It, so that's yeah. one concept. But you guys said something, uh, Dr. Kula, you showed something that was in some of your books about um, cracking the code yeah. and some of the other things about, you know, which one doesn't fit. I don't, I got chills because I don't even know <laughs> if you guys realize mm -hmm. the suffering that we go through 
dealing with people who don't have basic logic. Yeah. And these are the things that are developed in preschool. You're mm -hmm. not going to ever be in high school and they'll be teaching you logic patterns. That's exactly. not something that's done at that level. No. If you don't go to kindergarten, there's some things you're never going to learn in your life. And you <laughs> yeah. may be able to read and write and count and do arithmetic, but when you get your math set, you can't put the triangle in the triangle section because right. you never did that. Yeah. And if you don't do that as a, as a small child, you're mm -hmm. never going to do that ever. Right? And so if you don't know how that. to recognize patterns, mm -hmm. you're never going to recognize patterns. You're not going to know how to... Um, color coordinate, you're not going to know how to file things in order, mm -hmm. you're not going to know how to organize your desk or organize your closet based yep. on the way things go together, you're going to yeah. stack plates on top of bowls, Yeah, you know, you're, <laughs> no, I that. mean, these, these are simple, yes. these are simple daily yep. life tasks, because mm -hmm. you never learn these basic, so for me, I mean, I was raised doing logic puzzles because that's the type of mother that I had, mm -hmm. that was our fun task, logic puzzles yeah. and crosswords and and the highlights magazine where you find the, yes. the um, <laughs> you find yes. the, 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 the little highlights. object. But those early learning logic things, yeah, that is transformative for society. Because yeah. living in Liberia full time and you can go to a bank or you can go to an institution yes. and the person cannot follow your logic pattern. And yeah. it's not about they can't read. It's not about they can't fill out the form. It's the logic pattern, right. which is yeah. something very intangible. Oh. Yeah, And if you have missed it and reached adulthood without it, it's very difficult to explain to an adult yes. how to grasp that. So yes. this is this is society transformative work. Those logic patterns, mm -hmm. that early childhood yeah. education, it is generationally transformative. Okay. Yes. Having yes. lived in the generation that didn't have it, like watching the generation that didn't have it, I can tell you the difference that's going to make in 15, 20 years, yes. if that happens at a wide scale now, it yeah. will be a different society. And uh -huh. this is something that we see oftentimes mm -hmm. with, um, and you know, there's a lot of contention about it. You will see people who move from the diaspora back to Liberia, mm -hmm. and maybe we're in marketing or comms or whatever, and they get to Liberia and they work in a totally different field. And they succeed in that field. And the, the people who were born and raised in Liberia have a lot of contention because this person has a degree in it. I study for it, but they had logic analysis yeah. and transfer. That's analysis. true, yeah. And nobody can understand how somebody came from a comms background and has now gone into administration or whatsoever, or came from yeah. a finance background and is now in marketing. It is because it's not the finance degree. It's the logic and the ability to recognize patterns and figure things out that's allowing them to succeed in a field they never formally studied. Girl, and that, that is intangible. <laughs> now, I mean, I, I go honestly when I when I heard you talking about logic. Mm -hmm. Oh my God! It, it's oh, like, it's like usually when she get to the to the closing point, then we kind of lose her there in the sweetest part oh, of it. No. But, but to follow up on what Dr. Cooper was saying, like mm -hmm. all of us are saying here, this is going to be the found, building the foundation of bedrocks of mm -hmm. our society again. Yeah. I just wanted to provide some information. Uh -huh. Most of our tribes are written, and a lot of our people actually read them. The mm -hmm. Lutheran Church of Liberia have translated seven of our tribes. Oh, this book, oh she's back. Okay. This book is seven tribes of Liberia, all with the alphabets, the numerics, the oh, basics. That's good. That's I good. Think Connecting with a group like that in all Lutheran churches, the Bible is translated in all of those seven languages. People read them every Sunday. Yeah. But the mm -hmm. type of foundational piece you guys are creating, and we don't have to just write them down. Some of them can be taught orally. Yeah, yeah. And teach yeah. kids some material, right? So mm -hmm. find a way to gradually start to build some of that. And this is tra transformational. Yeah, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. First, the first packet. Um, okay, that's um, cool. the show. I want to sign in. Yeah, I'm listening. Yeah, I'm listening to this and it's so amazing. You know, yesterday I participated in a competition and it's, you know, where you have kids that were competing on developing and, you know, developing apps. So you had, you know, schools, you know, several different schools that participated in this. And the kids had only one hour and 30 minutes to, to build an app. And these are kids that have never, ever been involved in any form of technology. I mean, from different schools. You even had some of the children, which broke my heart, were children who are kids of that so-called word that we use in Liberia called Googles. I hate to use that word. But, you know, their kids were also a part, you know, so these are kids whose parents are struggling with drug and alcohol abuse and what have you. But mm -hmm. they also participated yesterday. 
and it was quite impressive. And they were primarily like around the six, seven years old, you know, that's a six, six to 12 year old um, group. But to see them get it, you know, in one and a half hours and, and be able to stand in front of a group of nearly 100 people and do presentations, let me know that the Liberian children are very, very smart. Yes. So the opportunity, you know, and so I think what you all have is an opportunity. And so I really yes. hope that people will support it and that people will, you know, take these children. I mean, I, I, the lady was handling this program with the kids that are, whose parents are dealing with alcohol and drug abuse. Her name is Janet. And I asked her yesterday, I said, Janet, so what, what happens with these children? She said, I said, they have to go back into these, um, you know, the ghettos right after, you know, I'm done with them to go right back. You know, so how do we begin to, to impact these children? Because they are the next generation and, 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 and they want to do better. You know, so I, I really hope that people will support the project and, and really, you know, um, finance and, and give as much as we can to make sure that the kids, all of these kids can have access to these packages. Yes, thank you. And then Nicole, Dr. Cooper, you were going to finish up and then we need to get into your segment for your medical stuff. But can you finish up? <laughs> oh, yes. I was just saying, I, I didn't even know if, I know that it was you, your brainchild, but I don't even know if you realize, uh, I, I, you know, how transform, transformation it will be. I personally wish it could even be accelerated so we could be 20 years from now, now, you know, I just know. to be feeling the impact of, of yes. some of this in our society. It would yes. really, the functioning, the general functioning level of society will change. Yes. Seriously, yeah. So Corporal Laga, I had a, a comment. After Corporal Laga, is it okay if we go to Dr. Cooper? I know we're running out of time. And we really need to hear what Dr. Cooper has to say. The I program think, she's I, bringing is awesome. I think Anthony was arranging with Dr. Cooper to have her on separately, just her. Oh, that would be yeah, great. Too, but going, rather than squeezing it in, but I don't know what, what the thoughts are. But, but can we at least hear a little bit of it? It's very important. Anthony. Yeah, then okay. Cor, uh, you can go ahead. Okay. Sure. I'm, I'm not going to present, but I will just talk a little bit about what I have. And I've said some of it already, but I am going to continue. Um, going back to the point that I made earlier about reconsidering what we're thinking of as a fresh start. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it can be very disparaging for people on the ground to hear things like, you know, uh, that, that give the impression that there is nothing on the ground. There is not mm -hmm. nothing on the ground. There are things on the ground. There are seeds that are growing. There are mm -hmm. pockets that are, that are working, those pockets need to increase and coalesce together. So the concept again of the fresh start is the concept of who is responsible for this fresh start or who is going to implement this fresh start. It is important that we hold our leaders accountable for the resources that they wield and for the results that they, they give us from those resources. But it's also equally important in the meantime. Oh. Every time it gets good. That's that's, think, that's one of the reasons why we need to arrange to have her maybe just for Oh, her, her stuff yeah. is so good. Okay, um, so Corbella like guy, why don't you say what you were going to say while we're waiting for her? This time. Okay, I was just going to finish up saying that the that with what Dr. Cooper was saying, that was the logic behind the task cards. Yeah. They are task cards yeah. that support independent learning, mm -hmm. but also bring in other skills that children need. Yeah. As the more you can build those networks in their brain while they're young, it's easier as they get older. So it's yep. not just about literacy. They gain confidence in being able to read, and then their parents gain confidence in their children. And like she said, it impacts the wider society. So yeah, as I was developing those, that is the, the logic behind such a simple thing that a child can do, but it has such a huge impact. Yeah. yeah. All right. At this time, Leo, uh, we'll take a break. And when we come back, we'll look into comments. And oh, Dr. Cooper's back. Uh, when we get them. OK. Uh, because of time and uh Dada Cooper, like you agree, we will schedule with you so that you can present that valuable information. Yes, it's very valuable. It's good for all of us uh, to hear from you. So we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll be doing comments and then calls, and then we'll go into closing. And you guys can very well contact us again, you know, to do more. I know the multiple topics, so uh, we can nail it all in detail as we all want to. So a short break, and we will be.
right back. At Focus on Liberia, we discuss everything Liberia, from education to politics, arts and culture, entertainment, agriculture, history, religion, family, and technology. Focus on Liberia uncovers and showcases the best of Liberia and shows the world the truth about Liberia. We educate, elevate, and promote all things Liberia. We conduct interviews, panel discussions, debates, and more. Tune in to Focus on Liberia on Facebook and YouTube and be a part of the stories that make up the news. This is Focus on Liberia, and I am Dennis Jack. And I am Anson Nessier with my partner, Leo Johnson. In the program you are watching is Focus on Liberia Spotlight, a program we use to throw the spotlight on extraordinary Liberians doing extraordinary things for the improvement of Liberia. We are back with you. We will be reading comments here uh, quickly, and uh, we will read a few of them. Uh, let me start from the beginning and see which ones we can read here quickly. Let us hear from um, Mohammed uh, Masakwe, uh, watching watching from Bombay Highway, uh, Adama Town, Amadou Town, uh, respectively. So people are watching. Uh, let us hear from uh, Dr. Pajibo here, watching from Ghana. In as much as we are craving for the involvement of the diaspora our people back home should be willing to open their arms to receive ideas and other benefits uh let us hear from uh stanley thomas uh say on say one uh this is what i set fol apart from most media institution i left liberia many years ago and i want to go back for vacation where do I start in terms of attraction, entertainment, culture, heritage, and food? How is getting around to those places? You see, so you are giving somebody the leeway here, yeah, which is pretty go. good. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Pajibo here again writes, uh, what Liberia lacks as, I mean, so much is not human and material resources per se, our problem largely is poverty of mm. poverty of ideas and leadership. This is mm. the very reason we need to be united and see ourselves as a single nation. Um, this one is from uh, our CEO. Watch focus on Liberia for the diversity in internet television programming. We educate, we elevate, and promote all things Liberia. Then is right. Uh, Dr. Pajibo, yeah, again, the branding of Liberia should also start with a very independent judicial system that is in, that is investment friendly, he writes. Um, this one from our YouTube channel, uh, this person you turn the page liter literally, uh, I think literally, or uh, should we be celebrating Juneteenth? Uh, mm -hmm. make that connection with 1822. Mm -hmm. uh, that okay. is the question there. Let's hear from Andrew Tucker. Thanks ever so much, I believe, for the show. And I am watching you from my Bella community, Kakata City, Magibi County. People are watching. You don't believe. Uh, now you believe it. Nyata <laughs> uh, Heron uh, writes, man, I'm just on for a meeting. But I mean now, but I am loving what I'm hearing right now. You <laughs> have to love it. Uh then the mental monfosa says here, uh waiting your turn is learn at the beginning level. How do we trace some of the ills in our society to the lack of these business skills in Kidon Garden? Then as with Kidon Garden, and I think he's going back. A long one from Yanta again, exactly. Our reason for establishing Moravia Rees and Liberia things. Uh, cheese is the game in schools and communities. Uh, when I watched the Kidon Garden children set up a cheese bowl that just validated the point you just made, our children are extremely bright. Things are happening on the ground. Uh, and yes, 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 our drug challenge youth people, young people are not illiterate by 
no means she concludes and this one is from uh Stafford in central central uh are there any education programs being developed for adults a few comments dad and uh, back with you any of you can respond well i'll start with the juneteenth right can, mm -hmm. can i say something about the juneteenth yeah please when, yeah when we posted things about the juneteenth a lot of people said what does juneteenth have to do with 1822 the connection of this is the freedom of a people liberation it's always been key with people of color. So you've got the people of 1822 who went to Liberia. They had not been to West Africa since they were taken from there, but they left everything that they may have had here in America because it felt like true freedom would only come if they were outside of this country and they were able to be somewhere where they had a footing, you know, in the ground. And so they were rushing to that liberation, to that, that freedom. Same thing with the people of, of, of Galveston, of, of Texas, when they got the news that they were free. They too were waiting for that day of freedom to come. So at the end of the day, the connection here is freedom. Yeah. It is liberty. We as people of color, through all of the issues with slavery, all of the issues with, oh, are we free? Are we not free? Where does true freedom live? Is it here in America? Is it across the borders? Blah, blah, blah. You know, all this good stuff. It all boils down to we as a people, we are resilient and we want what we believe to be true freedom. And that true freedom in, in uh, Texas was Juneteenth. Then, you know what I'm saying? And that freedom back in 1822 for some of us was Liberia. So that is your connection is the liberty and the freedom of a people. That to Dr. me Kula, can speaks I, volume. Yes. Can I follow up on that comment yes. about Juneteenth? Yeah. You know, 1822 was the beginning. It wasn't a static point. Exactly. 1822 was the beginning of of mm -hmm. of emigration to Liberia. Yes. And it was the beginning of emigration for all free black people anywhere in the world. But yes. that opportunity was not available to everyone. Everybody until exactly 1865 Juneteenth, yes. right? Because mm -hmm. in 1822, freed people, freed um freed slaves or former enslaved people started coming back. Some of their counterparts in Texas didn't even know oh, that they weren't supposed yeah. to be slaves anymore. Yes. So it. Juneteenth is when they actually got to know that mm -hmm. they actually had that freedom. Yes. And, you know, uh, you mentioned that it's all about liberation. And indeed, it's true. You know, the mm -hmm. motto on our coat of arms, which I usually wear you know, every day, is the love of liberty brought us, brought here. us here. But yeah, I right. usually say more accurately the love of liberty brought us together. together there were like some that. people already here. Let's let's just be honest. Yeah. There were some people already here, but it's the love of liberty that brought us together as a nation. Right. 1822 is when the love of liberty brought some people across the ocean to meet others who were already here, rightfully. That's right. That's right. But 1847 oh. is when the love of liberty brought us all together because what was happening in the region at that time, that is when everybody, all of our neighbors were being colonized. And because the colony, the, the, the settled colony, not foreign colony um, of Liberia at the time had international recognition and was able to offer protection from European empire and colonization, we came together, right? So that is 1847 is when the love of liberty brought us together as a nation. Education, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So yes, it's all about liberty and that opportunity for 1822 was not even available to everyone until 1865. So 1865 is, is almost like part B yes. of what started in 1822. Mm -hmm. And for me, that is why um, that is why I have to say Juneteenth is one of my favorite holidays that exists in any country. <laughs> yeah. Because it, it is it is the official writing of such a severe injustice that was happening yes. at the time. Yeah. Uh, that that has to be celebrated far more than holidays that celebrate, for example, the author of the largest Holocaust in the Western Hemisphere has yeah. his own holiday. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. He has his own holiday in October in the U.S. But this holiday writes a wrong. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to go on to a soapbox, but I'll leave it there. But, but Benji, you know, June, June 19th. I have something else to do. Hold on a second. Benji, Dr. Cooper, yeah. on, on the 19th, you're at the church. On yeah. the 19th of June, come to Juneteenth celebration. You will see how both of these time periods are coming together. Yes. Go ahead, Hesta. Okay. Now, what I, was, what I was trying to say is that Liberia, also beyond just um, those of us that you say, well, the, you had those that were on the ground, then you had those free Blacks that came to Liberia. One of the things that we must also realize about Liberia is that when the free Blacks came to Liberia, 
One of the things that they vowed to themselves was that they would never, ever allow slavery again. And we must keep in mind that at that time, slavery was still very much um, prominent on the West African coast. So what they began doing, they began going onto the high seas along with those natives that were already in Liberia, the Africans that were here. They began joining them and going on the high seas, and they began arresting boats and ships that were carrying slaves into the New World. So they began bringing those people, as they would capture those slaving vessels, they would bring, bring them back to Liberia. And so Liberia also became home of repatriated Blacks that were going into slavery from um, areas around West Africa. So Liberia is truly a pan-African nation. And then we saw coming into um, the, the 1840s, people like Wilma J. Blyden from places like the British West Indies, you know, Jamaica. You had people coming from um, Panama, the Bahamas. And so Liberia is a true, true pan-African nation. So we, when we talk about celebrating all Blacks, we don't just celebrate Liberia, but we, Liberia is the only country on the, on this, in this world that is a melting pot of Black people. So Juneteenth is certainly one of uh, on those uh, um, celebrations. I grew up in Fort Worth. So I was, you know, Fort Worth is what, where Juneteenth actually happened. So I know the whole history, you know, with Juneteenth in terms of the people in Fort Worth learning years later that the rest of America was, you know, was free. So we always made jokes about that in high school. But um, Liberia is, is, is a country that should celebrate, I mean, that Black people around the world should come to because this is the only country in the world that brought and opened its arms to Blacks from every area on earth. Just wanted to add that. <laughs> Thank, thank you, and thank you. Uh, beautiful answers there from all of you. Let me read a few more uh, comments. And I have a little video of a different national talking about Liberia. And I think it will inspire all of us yeah. mm -hmm. uh, to see our country for what it is. It is one of the best. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me read a few comments quickly. <laughs> and uh, I think I saw this one. OK, this one from. Uh, Alita or uh, Anan, I would like to express my thanks and appreciation to the entire guest speakers tonight for sharing the topics of education in Liberia because there is a huge vacuum for the kids in Liberia in terms of learning for the kids. Foundational learning from K5 and thereon. Thanks very much for all. Thanks very much to you all for the topic on education, as uh, she concludes. Uh, this person from our uh, YouTube, right? Freedom can be the connection, but to do Liberians on ground hold, but do Liberians on ground hold that same sentiment of freedom? Yes, mm -hmm. I think they do. 1822, 1865, decades different. I agree that the connection of liberty, we, I mean, will, we hold this hard of day. Uh, that person, I believe, concluding there with a question, but I see an exclamation point there. I saw this one too that I need to read from Tobas. Okay, yeah, it is. Long one there. Um, 60 minutes documentary on Liberia during the Toman and the Tobot regimes. Mm -hmm. According to the 60 minute uh, reporter, or a guy from America was a memory, a grand old flare with uh, mm -hmm. 49 fewer stars. The currency is the US dollar. The mailboxes are American. The coup of the beat on the beat on the beat was New York City uh, police department uniform. The capital is named after US President James Moron to be continued. I don't know where he's going with that, but <laughs> it's a little piece of history there. Then let me bring the video and I will let you guys to think about it, comment, and then we can conclude. Yeah, it is. What do you make of Ni Liberia then and now? Knowing Liberia. what happened in Liberia. Liberia was a haven right. at that time. You know, you could get everything under the sun. When we got to Liberia in 1981, in fact, I got there in uh, October 81, and the coup happened in December. I, Liberia was using the American dollar. So you can imagine. Yeah. They lack. So it's just the first statement there. Mm -hmm. Liberia was everything. 
Mm -hmm. Try everything in Liberia. Yep. This is, I believe, a Ghanaian national mm -hmm, yeah. uh, speaking the Liberia she saw many years ago that it was more like a place uh, to be, even though we didn't have everything, but it was a place to be intense. They could go to Ga when, um, Liberia, she said, that way you would go to buy just about anything uh, they wanted mm -hmm. at the time. And I see all your efforts. And what I see is you want us to get back to that place. Yes. Yeah, exactly. All the nationals and we will see back us. There. Yeah. Every, we can every, get back there. I believe yeah. we can. Yeah. 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 Every national will see Liberia uh, the way she saw Liberia many years mm -hmm. ago. Uh, and I think we we can do it. So as I, I think you are you are you are angry. I mean hungry to jump in here. So please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Not angry, excited. Yeah. Uh, listen, one of the things that we must realize about our country. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've gone through so much in terms of war. We've mm -hmm. gone through so much in terms of our own disagreements, internal strife, and what have you. Mm -hmm. But the history remains the same. Mm -hmm. Liberia is what it is. This is the beacon of hope. For Africa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. When you look at Liberia, when you talk about the organization of African unity, in 1962, it was in Senequil in County mm -hmm. that you had President Tubman, Kwame Nkrumah, and Sekuturi sit down and draft the first uh, um, draft of what we now call the Africa Union. Mm -hmm. Today, when we look at Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, Addis Ababa is saying they are the home of the African, uh, you know, of the organization of African unity. We are sitting by and seeing our history being depleted or taken away from us because we are not doing anything about it. Look, mm -hmm. we cannot change history. Liberia is what it is. When you look at the Organization of African Unity or the AU as it is today, the AU is an organization that, that says that each country in Africa will have its own president. That was mm -hmm. President Tubman's idea of what, or of what the Africa Union should be. Sekutura, I mean, not Sekutura, Kwame Nkrumah was, you know, his belief was that there should be one president and it should be a pan-Africanist um, continent or one big, you know, country. But today, when you go to the AU, you do not see Tupman highlighted, but rather you do see Kwame Nkrumah um, highlighted more than Tupman. And I'm saying this to say that as we sit by and we continue to look at Liberia as Liberians and not appreciate all that we have done in history. When President Tuckman became president of Liberia, there were only four countries on the African continent, I mean, that were, that were independent. When he left, there were 40 countries that were independent. Mm -hmm. Liberia has been at the pinnacle of freedom. Liberia has been at the pinnacle of driving Africa. We mm -hmm. have the first, one of the first five-star hotels in West Africa, the Dukor Palace. It was from Dukor Palace that Abidjan got its Hotel Ivoire, and it began the brand of renaissance for, for um, Ivory Coast. So Liberia is a country that, unless we Liberians stop all of our bickering and begin to appreciate the beauty of what we have, granted we've had all of these different issues and challenges, but it is those issues and challenges that have made us who we are. And we must come together and begin appreciating this and begin developing and building a powerful nation that we are. You know, and I say this passionately because I firmly believe this is the beginning of Africa. This is the first country on the continent to become independent. The only country that became independent in the, in the 1800s after us was Ethiopia in the 1880s. Mm -hmm. so we hold something very sacred. We Liberians must own it, take full uh, responsibility for it, and begin telling our story and stop being so silent as we are. Thank you, and I thank you for like your powerful closing that. And uh, you, you've been on the line for an hour and forty-seven minutes. Uh, Whoa! Your, 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 your data, your data is being harmonizing. Whoa! Like, and I, wow. I can't, I can't, I can tell the depth of your willingness to yes. see Liberia rise again uh, mm -hmm. from the conversation you made yeah. today. I want to say thank you for joining us. Bye bye now. All right. All right. So now we are here. We will take uh, each of you a uh, closing statement because of time. We have another broadcast that is coming up soon. Any of you can go first. I will go. All right. I would just like to say on the heels of what Hester just said, um, mm -hmm. back to my original statement about getting the diaspora involved. It is about knowing our history and finding that pride 
-hmm. And when you find that pride, you are more willing to give of your talents. And that's what we are doing here. My little contribution is early childhood. Understanding what children need, the different skills they need, and empowering teachers and parents to be able to help children learn how to read because literacy unlocks so many things. If our children can read, they can understand their history. They can understand and have pride in themselves as Liberians. And that is what I see greatly lacking in my fellow countrymen. And that is something I really feel that Yasaro's early learning and all the partnerships we establish will be able to contribute to the broader society. So thank you so much for having me on. This has been a great conversation to be a part of. Kobalaga, thank you for coming and I appreciate your perspective today. Dr. Kula. Yes, okay. So uh, first of all, let me just thank everybody for honoring our invitation to come on the show today. We really appreciate it. So on behalf of Yerda Daspor, on behalf of my Emergent Literacy Curriculum, on behalf of Providence Preservation Foundation, I say to you guys, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, just what Coralaga I say, as we're developing these early learning materials for students, we are very excited to do it because we know the bedrock is that foundation. And that foundation lies with pre-K, pre, uh, pre-K, kindergarten, and so on and so forth. But if we don't start at the root, the problem is going to continue to fester. So I'm uh, appealing to everybody in the diaspora. If you have a kid in library, you want to get some of these materials into their hands, please do contact us. Our learning pack was uh, put on the screen earlier. The, the, you, you can get our contact information off of that page. But the website is www.mylearningpack.com. We hope to hear from each of you. Uh, for those of you who are planning to travel to Liberia in July, we do have some trips, uh, some tickets at very good prices. Those of you who would like to come with us on this journey of rediscovering Liberia in December, uh, traveling to all of the wonderful destinations, I applaud you and I say, contact us. Let's get this trip going. We look forward to putting Liberia on the forefront and ensuring that we get more and more people who are interested in visiting Liberia and making an, uh, an even more valuable impact. So again, I say thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clarice for Kula there. Now we will come to Dr. Nico Cooper yes. for her closing. Thank you. So again, I just want to encourage everyone uh, listening, whether you're in Liberia, whether you're in the diaspora, just make sure that you become part of the critical mass on whatever side that you're in. Join the group of those that are doing the important work to change some of the patterns that are really going to develop our country. It is important for us to hold our leaders accountable, but it's also important for us to do our own work, right? We also have our own work. We also have things that we have to put our hand to, tasks that we have to put our hand to, to develop this country. No government single-handedly can develop a country. No public sector in any sector by itself develops a country because that's not innovation does not generally come from government. Mm -hmm. Innovation generally comes from the private sector, right? So healthcare is no exception. I sit in the healthcare field. We are innovating wildly at my clinic, innovating wildly. Um, I think that they're probably gonna put up the contact information www.wellnesspartnershealth.org. Check out the website, see some of the things that we are doing and join the movement. If, if there are things that you want to do, either come to Liberia, scope it out. I know Liberia is contagious, but by the time you get here, you will start coming back and forth saying, oh, I'm going yeah. in between. I'm coming back and next thing you know, you're living in Liberia. That's how it happens. Don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. Embrace the journey. That's how it happens to all of us. So come, come and see see what is on the ground, get the context. Don't sit outside thousands of miles away, uh, argue about politics, frustrate yourselves, and then not do anything to change the narrative. It, is, it must be extremely frustrating mm -hmm. to sit there and talk about a negative narrative that you're not impacting. So come, get the context first, the real context, not the context that you hear. Get the real context and then put your hand to the work. I know Leo didn't mention it, but Leo has really put his hand to the work. Oh, yes. This country. He really yeah. has. Yeah. He really has. And it's important to get that context because sometimes I hear discussions that people have in the diaspora. One time I heard someone say, you know, in that country, you can't even leave your house after dark. It's not safe. And I was thinking, what country is she talking about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I don't want to go to that place. What country is that? But I'm living here not knowing she was talking about Liberia. And I said, where do people get these things from? They hear it, you know, one person says it loosely, then it just starts to fly. 
but a lot of these things are not based in reality. They're, they're not. Maybe maybe there was an incident here, and someone mm -hmm. took it. You know, it, it it personally affected them, and so they made a, a gross generalization about it. But come and see for yourself. Come and see for yourself. Come get context into whatever it is that you want to do. Learn what already exists on the ground. Don't sit outside and assume that nothing is here. There are things here. And you too can be here, in fact. We are waiting for you. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cooper. Thank you so much, very much. We appreciate all of you for coming. Folks, this is how we will come to the end of this broadcast. This program focus on Liberia Spotlight. The song that crosses the broadcast always and always is We Are All Liberians. You heard from them. They are doing wonderful things in Liberia, and they are Liberians. They are not aliens. We all can do this. <laughs> we just have to decide to do it for our country. No one's going to do it. We have to do it. I hope I'm playing my part, even though it might not be enough for you, but that's what it is. <laughs> do your own. Until then, I'm answering this here saying bye-bye. Dada Kuba, I will reach out. Thanks. Yes, please do. We all love you, man.